Genesis chapter 1. Now last week we went over the first three days of creation, so we're going to be finishing up this week by looking at the final three days of creation. So we'll be picking up in verse 14. Father, we thank You, Lord, as we're turning to the verses today, that we know that You are going to speak to our hearts. And I pray You would bring encouragement to the believer, Lord, just how awesome You are and what You have done for us. And I pray if there's anyone here today and they have not made a real commitment to You, Lord, that today they would run out of excuses. That they would see how awesome You are and what You offer to them through Your salvation. And I pray today would be that day of salvation for them, Lord. Just minister to their hearts. And now we commit the time to You. Help us to stay attentive to Your Word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So here we see the, the production of, of God producing light for us. I've lived in the desert now for a little over 20 years. And when my wife and I first came up to visit her parents when they lived over in the Apple Valley area, I hated the desert. I didn't like the dirt. I didn't like the fact that it didn't have sidewalks and lights because that's what I grew up with down in San Bernardino area. And so we would go for walks after lunch visiting with our parents on a Sunday afternoon and we would walk along looking at just these weeds and dirt and the wind always blowing and I just thought, who on earth would want to live up here? And then, of course, this time of year, in the evenings, you know, being a lowlander, though the air up here was so crisp and cold, and it's like, man, you can't, I can't believe people would want to live up here. It's freezing up here. But you grow to love it, especially at night when you get that opportunity, which the only light you would ever see in San Bernardino were maybe a few stars and maybe the moon itself. But I've had people visit me that would stay for two or three days and didn't even know we had mountains around us down there because of the smog and all of that. And up here, you get to see still, it may not be long, but for right now, we get to see the sun, the moon, the stars at night. And uh, Well, you don't see the sun at night, but you know what I'm saying here. <laughs> but I feel sorry for those living below, and uh, they may be closer to some of the shopping centers, the bigger ones and all, but they miss out on being able to enjoy just going out at night and looking up at the skies. Have you ever wondered why God made the sun, the moon, and the stars? Well, He provides for us a threefold answer to this question right here in this passage. First of all, it says, He gave light upon the earth both during the day and at night. So He provided the daylight, the sun, and He also provided the moon and the stars at night. So the sun and the moon and the stars separate the day from the evening. Second, they exist to measure the process of time. It says here that they were created for days and for years. And so they are the means by which we measure time as days go by. Seven days make a week and, and so on. And third, they're des designed to mark significant events. They are for signs and they are for seasons. And there are certain seasons that we're interested in. First service, we had a bunch of people. I don't see any here right now. We had a bunch of people wearing Pittsburgh Steeler jerseys. And so this is a certain season that people are interested in a certain game that called the Super Bowl. And so a lot of people are, are you know, chomping at the bit to get that going. It's for the signs and for seasons. And the entire record of human history confirms the truth of all of this. And this is exactly what the sun and the moon and the stars do for us. We know 
that the rotation of the earth is what determines the length of a day. So the speed of the earth as it rotates on its axis determines the 24-hour day that you and I live in. Yet that speed of the earth isn't just spinning faster and faster and faster. It's regulated. This is just so mind-boggling to me that God does this. The speed of the earth is regulated by the moon, which acts as a break upon the earth by raising and lowering the tides of the oceans. Is that awesome or what? It restricts the speed of the rotation of the earth to the exact time that makes it possible for us to have a 24-hour day, which is just the length of time best adapted to the needs of man. And if that's not remarkable enough, if you look at other planets, why God put us on this earth and why it's so perfect, other planets have entirely different lengths of days. There are some planets that a day would occupy a month or even a year of what we call a day or a year of our time. Others go much more rapidly. For instance, Jupiter, which is the largest planet, it has only about nine hours in its day. Could you imagine having to live on that planet? You think you don't have any time in your day now. <laughs> you only have nine hours in a day to get everything done in. So God has designed a 24-hour day for our planet because it precisely fits the needs of man. The orbit of the earth around the sun determines the length of the year, which again is just right for all of our needs. Now, no one really knows what determines the velocity of the earth. They haven't been able to figure that out. What is keeping us from just spinning out of control and just buzzing off into space like a, a top being thrown? What keeps all of that? The strange force that puts us through space. We're traveling right now at about 1,100 miles per minute. Isn't that incredible? And yet, we're not being thrown off the earth. We're sitting here comfortable. We don't even have a breeze blowing. And here we're told that God has ordained the sun and the moon to provide measures of time which mark off the segments of our life. This is just a amazing stuff. Over in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 147, verse 4, and also in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 40, verse 26, both of them tells us that God has all of the stars numbered and has a name for each one. Is that incredible? You know, you think your problems are too big for God, and yet every single star that's out there. We just recently discovered a new a possibility of a new planet out there. And yet God, it says in Isaiah particularly, that God has never forgotten any of them. He has never lost any of them. I can't even keep my car keys that long. And God has got all the stars numbered and has a name for every one of them, and none of them have He lost. That's amazing. Some have mistakenly viewed these words, signs and seasons, as a biblical justification to study astrology. They call it the zodiac. And in astrology, those who follow that, they use the stars and all of these planets and everything for guidance in their life. But the Bible tells us that the stars and all of this is merely a display of the handiwork of God. What folly to follow these astrological charts and stuff. One should really trust in the one who made these objects in heaven rather than follow the objects themselves. However, many humans repeatedly reject God and have chosen to go and worship the creature rather than the creator. Even some of our presidents, just mind-boggling to me, presidents that I have respected, at least their one particular one I'm thinking of, his wife would go and uh, consult with these astrologers whether they should travel abroad or, or whether they should speak on a certain issue or whether they should hold back on that. A president of the United States seeking astrologers for guidance for the United States of America. Why, why do people, why would people look to the stars when they can call upon the one who made these stars? Many people who lived in the ancient times, ancient civilizations, would follow these astrological charts. This is nothing new that we've come up with recently. The ancient Chinese, for instance, came up with the same concept as the Babylonians 
who followed these. The Chinese zodiac has 12 categories similar to the Babylonians. The 12 categories were represented by 12 animals. So when you break open these little fortune cookies, a lot of times they'll have some stupid saying on the front, you know, that today is a good day for you or something, you know. But you flip it over and it'll have something about this day. And it'll tell you about the month and what it means and if you were born in this date and this time and that kind of a thing. So if you were born in 1956, you would be in the year of the monkey. There's no pun intended there, but you were born in the year of the monkey. Now, with following that thought out, if that's the case, then anyone born in 1956 and again in 1968 and again in 1980, and every 12 years since the beginning of time, you should have the same fate and the same future. But they don't. Why is that? Well, because it's bogus. This stuff doesn't work. And now we've got a new problem because we have a new planet out there. What are they going to do now? Change their zodiac to accommodate the new planet? Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 25 Paul says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Listen to what he says. They worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God will give you up to these things if you want to follow after them. So our lesson as Christians to learn from all of this, from Romans 1, is we shouldn't even be messing with this stuff. Christians shouldn't be going to fortune tellers, shouldn't be going to the Ouija boards or astrological anything. But we should be going to the living God and getting our direction from Him. Verse 16 says, God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now, I don't want you to miss this here. This has kind of really caught me because I almost skimmed right over it. But it reads here, He made the stars also. Only five words to describe the making of all the stars of heaven. That's all the time He gives to the creation of all the stars in heaven. Why are there only five words devoted to this incredible event that spans our universe and makes up our solar system? Well, I believe it's because God is focused primarily on the earth because that's where man lives. While the earth physically revolves around the sun, the earth has positional superiority in God's plan and purpose. It was on the earth that God made man and He created us to have fellowship with Him right here. And so the earth is far superior to any other thing, planet or star out there. This is where God's focus is. Now there's also a great parallel to look at here. We can look at this as the sun representing Jesus Christ. It's a symbol of the Lord. And the moon can be a picture of the church. The moon, the church, we do not have any means of producing light on our own. I don't have life and light in me, but what Christ gives me. But the Scripture tells us as a church that you are a light. You are the salt of the earth and you are the light. It's our responsibility to illuminate this world as it lives in its darkness. And the moon reflects the light of the sun. Now listen, the only time that the moon does not reflect the light of the sun is when? When there is an eclipse. And that is when the earth gets between the two. Do you see where I'm going with this? It's when you allow the earth, the things of the world, to get between you and the sun, that's when things start having problems. That's when darkness will come into your life. And that's when your light will not shine. We are to be a reflection of of the Son of God to this world. Now the question is, how much of a reflection are you? You watch it as it goes through the month and you see just a little sliver of the moon. Sometimes you'll see a quarter moon, sometimes a half moon, sometimes three quarters, sometimes that big, bright, full moon that we have. Which one are you? Are you just a little sliver 
just a little tiny glimpse of the sun, when you're out there, not on Sunday morning here in church, but when you're in the workforce, when you're out there at the schools or wherever you conduct yourself through the week, how much of the Son of God do you give through your life do you reflect to this world? We should set our hearts on one thing and one thing only, to reflect the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to others around us. And we can do that wherever we're at. God has placed every one of us in different positions for a purpose and for a reason. And when the world looks at us, they should see a glimpse of Jesus Christ. So God, verse 17, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now we come to verse 20 and the account of the fifth day of creation. God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. And certainly when you go into the aquarium of the oceans and you see some of those living creatures, it is spectacular. I love looking at ocean mammals and, and the sea creatures when you can go to the aquariums. I've got to go to some of them in other countries even, and it's mind-boggling. I don't know if you've ever got to see a platypus, but they are the most awesome creature to look at. And you wonder, God must have a sense of humor, because they are the ugliest looking thing you've ever seen in your life. And you just wonder, sometimes looking at them, you wonder, well, which end is the front and which end is the back? You're not quite certain. It's a weird looking thing. But God made all of these creatures... And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind. Notice that and maybe underline that. According to their kind. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So on the fifth day, God created all sorts of marine and animal life and all the birds. And so we see the great variety of birds and other flying things. This even includes flies and mosquitoes. And I'm not quite certain exactly what purpose they have, but I'm sure that they do. Just not in my life. And notice the use of the phrase in verse 21, according to their kind. Now, we pointed this out before, but it's important for us to know it and to see it. God deliberately structured plenty of variation, but it stays within its kind. So even though you may have a winged animal or a winged insect such as a fly, it will never mate with a winged animal such as a parrot. You'll never have a fly and a parrot producing something. You're never going to have a parrot and a giraffe producing something. It stays within its kind. But one kind does not become another kind. In verse 21, the term there, sea creatures, is the word tannin. It's a word that means dragon. And so, this is a reference probably here to ocean dinosaurs. Now, according to the Bible, the ocean dinosaurs, or these large animals of some kind, these dragons, were created on the fifth day. And it mentions again these large animals that were created on the sixth day that were land dinosaurs or land dragons. The Bible even describes one of them from Job chapter 40 verses 15 through 19. It says there in Job 40, Look at the behemoth which I made along with you. Isn't that interesting? We say that, oh, evolution states that dinosaurs lived millions of years before man. Well, here it says that they were made along with you and which feeds on grass like an ox. The original plan, lions, Tigers and bears, oh my, all lived together in the Garden of Eden and they were all uh, vegetation-eating animals. They didn't go after, they weren't carnivorous and go after human flesh or any other kind at that time. But uh, again, that was part of the fall when they began to do that. But look at the behemoth which I made along with you, which, which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins. What power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. 
The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs are like rods of iron. And so this gives us some proof that man and dinosaur lived together, not separated by millions of years. Now, there are people who object to the idea that dinosaurs lived alongside a man, but their objection doesn't hold any factual reason. Their object because they object rather because they have been conditioned by what they're taught oftentimes in schools. That's why it's so important for us to teach our children the truth and to teach them how to understand and study the Word of God on their own before they get to college. Because a lot of kids don't know that. They take on the religion of their parents because their parents... And when they move out and go off to college, they don't have the, the ability to reason from the Word of God. And so they're easily swayed by what they're taught in these colleges. But they object because, they say, of what the fossil records show us. Now, if you were to go to the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, it contains a continuous record of various fossil deposits. The geologists will claim that some of these deposits are as old as 5 million years. Now, because the records are so complete, the paleontologists assume that there is a positive trail of evolution that can be found there. And they set out to prove that. But instead, after much research, they've not found one ounce to back their theory. In fact, one evolutionist wrote, after looking at these records, We paleontologists have said that the history of life in the fossil records support the story of gradual evolution. All the while, we know that it just simply does not exist. That's coming from someone themselves who studied this. You see, just because something is fossilized, it doesn't mean that it took millions or even thousands of years for that to happen. When conditions and materials are right, a bone can fossilize fairly quickly. What are the conditions? It's just basically three. A quick burial. Number two, a suitable amount of water. And number three, the right amount of minerals. Conditions during Noah's flood were ideal for fossilizing millions of animals and plants, including dinosaurs. Back in 1977, those of you might remember, that the nets of a Japanese fishing ship caught the decaying body of a large, strange reptile near New Zealand. Photographs and measurements and tissue samples shall show that it was probably a Paleosaurus. The theory of Nebraska man was constructed on the basis of a pig's tooth. In the beginning, they thought it was a man. And they found it merely to be a tooth of a pig. Second, the theory of pit-down man was also built around a modern ape's jaw. So they thought it was a man, and they found out it was nothing more than the jaw of an ape. And of course, for a long time, the evolutionists were beaming over the discovery of the Neanderthal man. They thought that this primitive man was the missing link between modern man and the ape. Because the primitive man was a little slouched in his form, he had brow ridges, the bulbous forehead, sloping shoulders, bowed legs, and other so-called primitive features. But as time has gone on and tests have changed, scientists like Dr. Francis Ivanhoe found that the Neanderthal man's primitive features were due to a softening of the bone and other pathological conditions caused by severe vitamin D deficiency. He crippled him further simply with arthritis. So be careful of arthritis. You'll become Neanderthal man. Now, if he could come back from the grave today, I think he would say, I wasn't a caveman. I just hurt. (laughs) That's all it was. Dr. Arnold Pinsas holds a Ph.D. in physics from Columbia University. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for physics in 1978. And he said, people... They just don't want to accept the observational evidence that the universe was created. 
Despite the fact that the creation of the universe is supported by all the observable data astronomy has produced so far, the observations of modern science seems to lead to the same conclusion as century-old intuition. This is where it's leading. Even the scientists are beginning to come to these same conclusions. And then as God's crowning event, verses 24 and 25 leads into the creation of man. But look, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Here He creates cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And it says, and God saw that it was good. So God on the sixth day brings forth the land animals now and the reptiles of all sorts. And of course, we lead right in then to verse 26. Then when all of creation was done, when he made the heavens and the earth, he made food and provided the herbs for man to eat and all the vegetation. He separated the land from the sea, separated daytime from nighttime. He was finished. And then he says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So once again, we note here the plurality of let us make men in our image, indicating that there is a trinity. There is a God made up of three. You and I also were created as a trinity. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. God has created us, in a sense, in His image. We worship God. God the Father. We need to worship God the Son. And we need to worship God the Holy Spirit. There's an unbridgeable gap between the human being and the animal. We did not evolve from an ape or from any other oozing thing that came out of the ground. Man's different from every other order of created being because he has a created consistency with God. God put us superior over all of the other creation. We're to subdue it. We're to rule over this earth. Man alone has morality. Your pets are good, and you need to love your pets. But your pets don't have a morality. We are able to make moral judgments and have a conscience. Man alone has a spirit. I hate to pop that old bubble. I know there are many people who want to make sure that Fifi and Fido are with them in heaven. But I hate to tell you, Fifi and Fido don't have a spirit. God created man with a spirit. So man is made for communion with God. And it's on that level of spirit that we communicate with Him. There's no animals. There's no trees. There's no snakes. There's no cattle. There's no other created being that has this privilege to have a spirit and have an understanding and and the ability to be able to communicate with God on the level that we should. Now, the sad thing is, is we as human beings, we're the ones that have the ability to communicate with God and we as human beings don't. And yet, the Bible says that all of creation... Remember Jesus warned? He's coming into Jerusalem. They said, tell these people to quit praising you. They're all singing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Tell them to stop. And he said, if they stop, the very rocks will cry out. The rocks will worship God. Nature worships God. Nature is in complete agreement with God and and communicates in that sense where they obey God. Trees do what trees are supposed to do. Snakes do what snakes are supposed to do. Remember that song years ago where the guy took the snake in, it was almost frozen, and nurtured it back to life, and it bit him. He says, why did you bite me? He says, oh, shut up, silly woman. You know I'm a snake. You know this is what I do. Snakes do what snakes are supposed to do. 
Why is it human beings don't? God created us to have communication with Him, to have communion with Him. We are created to walk with God and to know Him. And we are the ones that have rejected the Lord. God has taken the beautiful work of creation. He did all that. And He poured life into it. What God did in creation, He wants to do today in your spirit. To give your spirit life. Jesus said, I have come to give, or I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He doesn't want you to just be alive today. He wants to give you abundant life. Now, He didn't say, I've come that they may have things and they can have things more abundantly. There's a lot of people, that's all they want. They want things and more abundantly. He didn't say, I have come that you may have years and have them more abundantly. There are a lot of people doing all they can right now to extend their lifetime. Now, I'm nothing wrong with that. But it's not the worst thing that can happen to a Christian, is it? If one of you or myself were to drop dead right now, we're in the presence of the Lord. That isn't such a bad idea. But yet there are people who just don't want that to happen. No, they'll do everything they can to try to extend their life. But he said he would give us life, abundant life. Now, do you have what you would call abundant life? There are Christians here today that would probably say, no, I don't look at my life right now as being what I would call abundant life. You see, life's not measured by the accumulation of things. And if that's what you're doing, and you're saying, well, I don't have the things that the Joneses have down the street. Well, you're measuring from the wrong measuring stick. It's not measured in days or in years. But abundant life is measured by our character. Abundant life is measured by our love. It's measured by our relationship with our Creator, whether you have one or not. When God created man, that is Adam and Eve, He created them to have fellowship with Him. And the one thing that separated that fellowship, what caused them to run and hide themselves from God? It was when they tasted of that apple and they saw They sinned. They fell. They created a division between them and God and they went and they hid themselves from the Lord. When He gives us new life, what He does is again opens the door for us to have an intimate fellowship with Him. If you want to know what real love is, if you want to know what real joy is, if you're lacking joy in your life, if you want to know what real peace is, it can only be found in the One who has the ability to create life. And that's Jesus Christ. That is the life that God gives us when we allow Him to create in us a new heart. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, now you may say, Pastor, you don't know the sins that I have done. Well, here's a man, David. A man who loved the Lord, who fell with a woman and got her pregnant. To cover up his sin, he brought her husband home from the war and tried to get him drunk that he might go and lay with his wife that later he would think that it was his child. The man wouldn't do it. So he had to come up with an alternative plan. And he put him on the front lines of battle and in the hottest part of battle he had the other men pull away from him and he was killed out there. Basically, David had this man murdered. What did David do? Well, in the beginning, he tried to cover it up. If you read Psalm 31, it'll tell you just how bad things got for David. You might read that and say, boy, that sounds like my life. But in Psalm 32, David finally does something about his sin. And he speaks forth and says, blessed is the man whose sin has been covered. He said, when I kept silent, when you don't go to the Lord with this, he said, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my insides were dried up like the drought of summer. Boy, is that vivid picture of someone that's imploding. They're just, there's no life in them. No joy, no peace, no happiness, no love. If you read in Psalm, I believe it's Psalm 51. There are two songs that we have sung here that come out of that verse. One of them tells us, Though your sins be as scarlet, the Lord says, I can make them as white as snow. Today, 
though your sins be as scarlet. No matter what you have done, God tells you the same thing. He can turn that around and make your life and clean it up and make it as white as snow. What a great promise that is. So David calls out to God and he says, later on in that verse of Psalm 51, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Who is David looking to for those things? It's always relying upon the Lord, knowing that none of that will come to him on his own efforts. So whether you be a Christian today or you're not a Christian today, you have to find God for that answer. You cannot clean up your own act. You cannot make things right. You cannot create. God is the one that creates. So David recognizing that says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Maybe some of you need that right now. Creating of a clean heart. Adam and Eve were created with a purpose though. One of the most discouraging things is when you find someone in the world that has no purpose. So you see, only the God who created the world can create life. But in the final verses we're going to look at here, we see that God doesn't just give us new life, but He also gives us a purpose. So listen, now I'm speaking to the Christian. If you've been born again and yet you don't have any purpose for your life, maybe you should listen up right here. Here's what he says. Then God blessed them, verse 28, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verse 29, God says, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food. And so it was. God provided all of man and animal's needs when He created. There wasn't anything lacking for them. And God saw everything that He had made and listened to the change of His Word here. He says, and indeed, it was very good. Up until now, he said it was good. But now he's finished with what he's doing. He now has placed men there. He now has finished what he's doing. And he looks over all of it and says, yeah, this is very, very good. And so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So if you've ever met a man or a woman who's going through life and just doesn't have any purpose, they're a miserable person. And I have seen that and I've understood some of it in their life. But if you don't want to become that man or that woman, if you want to have purpose in your life, there's some things that you can do. Adam and Eve were created with a purpose. First of all, we are told that we're to have fellowship with God. So if you want to have purpose in your life, the first thing that you need to do is start having fellowship with God. How do you do that? Well, number one, you read His Word. And number two, you pray. Seek the face of the Lord. Seek direction from the Lord. And God will begin to show you the things that He wants you to do. And you will have a purpose. Second, they were to be fruitful and multiply and they were to subdue the earth. Now, immediately, I've always read this to mean they began to have children. They produced and they were fruitful and they multiplied in numbers of people. But this could also mean being fruitful in the sense that go out and use the gifts that God has given to you and be fruitful with it. Do things with your life that mean something. Does your life have any meaning to it at all? What meaning does it have? If you're not fruitful and you're not seeking to go out and multiply, sharing the Gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing others come to the Lord, I'll tell you, I've always been a very shy person. I'm not real good at going on the streets. But the first time that I took that step of faith and I led someone to Jesus Christ, I can't tell you the excitement there is in being able to share the Gospel and see somebody respond to that. That's an awesome thing. To go out and multiply 
what you're doing. Put forth the effort. And finally, Adam and Eve were to be the original caretakers of God's creation. It is the church's responsibility. We are one generation away from extinction. Do you understand that? We don't have children and grandchildren in the Spirit. Your children have got to have their own relationship with Jesus Christ. So you young folks here, listen to that. You can't live off of your parents' relationship with the Lord. You need to have your own relationship with the Lord. It's a sad thing when kids grow up and and they've relied on their parents' relationship and they become an adult and they don't even know the Lord. Maybe raised in the church their whole life and yet they don't know the Lord. We are to be the caretakers of what God has given to us, folks. And as a church, as a whole, and as individuals, we have a responsibility to do something with what we're given as Christians. God has the same purpose for us that He had for Adam and Eve. God wants an intimate relationship with us. He doesn't want you to simply know, yeah, He's up there and when I need Him, I'll call upon Him. This is the principal reason Jesus Christ died on the cross, so that we could receive eternal life through Him and be adopted in the family and then have that relationship with Him. We're created in His image so that that fellowship can happen. He also wants us to be fruitful. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear, now listen to this, he will bear much fruit. But then he gives the other side of that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you're wondering why your life just isn't bearing the fruit that you want it to bear, possibly it is because you're trying to do it on your own ability. We need to abide in Him and allow Him to abide in us. That means live. Live in the Lord. Learn of the Lord. Grow in the Lord. Apply the principles of God's Word in our life and let Him live through us. Then your light will shine. Then you will be the salt of the earth. Isn't that what we said is wrong with much of the world today? Our lives are empty. Nothingness really is abounding today. But in Jesus Christ, we have purpose. We have meaning. Let me ask you a very important question to finish with today. Is there an aspect of your life that seems meaningless? I already know the answer if you're not a believer to that question. But Christian, is there a life, a part of your life that seems meaningless, that feels empty, void, or full of darkness? And I'm asking that question in all sincerity. Because you could be sitting here this morning. You could be listening to this message. And to the outside world, your life may be looking pretty good. You put forth a real good image. But inside, you know that you're doing nothing but putting on a show. Oh, you appear to everyone around you to be happy and content. But inside, you know that you're lost and troubled. There are a lot of people like that in churches today. Well, you can do something about that problem right now. God can give you that purpose and a reason to really live for Him. And He shows us right here. Let's pray.